Welcome back to Red Dwarf Infinity Welcomes Careful Drivers, the audiobook here on Fulcrum Entertainment. My name is Harry, your reader. If you're looking for the start of this audiobook or a different part within it, you can go into the description below to find a link to that and playlists for all our other audiobooks. Thanks very much to everyone listening, it's always great to have you there. Grady commented on the last video, said seriously loving this book and of course the amazing voices and narration. You are really talented. Thank you very much, Grady. Grady goes on to say, I'm a huge fan of British humour and especially sci-fi comedies like Hitchhiker's Guide, so I'm surprised I've never heard of Red Dwarf before. Thanks for sharing with us and keep up the great work. Yes, Grady, I think um, certainly outside of the UK, I think there are some shows that just didn't really get out as far. So to us here in the UK, they're real legends, but uh, they just didn't get there. Sometimes it can even be the previous work of people who later got international acclaim, but it just didn't get there. Like there are some things that Simon Pegg did back in the day that are kind of forgotten outside of the UK. A few people have mentioned Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and I think perhaps I will have to do that one day on the channel. That could be a lot of fun. I certainly used to absolutely adore the radio show of that. I had it all on cassette when I was a kid, and I listened and re-listened to it over and over again. I knew it off by heart almost at some points. I was a big fan of Zaphod Beeblebrox. Zaphod's uh, just some guy, you know? But that will have to be later. For now, we're returning to part two, chapter 16 of Red Dwarf Infinity Welcomes Careful Drivers. And this is following from the end of the last chapter, where the crew had received an SOS call. Lister grabbed a cup of tea from the dispensing machine. They collected the cat and caught the express lift down to comm level three. Aliens, said Rimmer, his eyes gleaming with the possibilities. It's aliens! Rimmer believed passionately in the existence of aliens. He was convinced that, one day, Red Dwarf would encounter an alien culture with the technology so far in advance of mankind's they will be able to provide him with a new body, a new start. It's aliens! he repeated. I know it! Your explanation for anything slightly odd is aliens, said Lister. You lose your keys, it's aliens. A picture falls off the wall, it's aliens. That time we used up a whole bog roll in a day, you thought that was aliens? Well, we didn't use it all. Rimmer shot him his best Rod Sterling Twilight Zone look. Who did? Aliens used up our bog roll. Just because they're aliens, it doesn't mean they don't have to visit the smallest room. Only, they probably do something weird and alien-esque, like it comes out the top of their heads or something. Lister sipped his tea and mulled the concept over. Well, he concluded, I wouldn't like to get stuck behind one in a cinema. A huge screen, a hundred metres square, hung down over the communications consoles, and four speakers, each the size of a fairly roomy Kensington bedsit, throbbed gently as Holly tried to establish contact by repeating a series of standard international distress responses over and over again in a variety of different languages. It's from an American ship, private charter, called Nova 5, said Holly tonelessly. They've crash-landed. I'm trying to get them on optical. Oh, Rimmer sighed with disappointment. So it's not aliens? No. They're from Earth. I hope they've got a few spare odds and sods on board. We're a bit short on a few supplies. Lister sipped his tea. Like what? Well, cow's milk, said Holly. We ran out of that yonks ago. Fresh and dehydrated. What kind of milk are we using now, then? Emergency backup supply. We're on the dog's milk. Lister froze, the styrofoam cup resting on his lips. The tea halfway down his throat. He swallowed. Dog's milk? Nothing wrong with dog's milk. Full of goodness, full of vitamins, full of marabone jelly. Lasts longer than any other kind of milk, dog's milk. Why? No bugger will drink it. Plus, of course, the advantage of dog's milk is, when it's gone off, it tastes exactly the same as when it's fresh. Lister dropped his cup into a waste chute. Why didn't you tell me, man? What, and put you off your tea? Something's happening. 
Rimmer pointed at the comm screen, which fizzled and buzzed with static. Slowly, an image formed. The flat, angular features of a mechanoid face. The head without curves, the mouth without lips. Thank goodness, thank goodness, bless you. Crichton clapped his hands together. We were beginning to despair. We? said the cat, arching his eyebrow. I am the service mechanoid aboard Nova 5. We've had a terrible accident. Seven of the crew died on impact. The only survivors are three female officers who are injured but stable. Female? The cat looked at Lister. Is that a female as in a soft and a squidgy? I am transmitting medical details. Digitized pictures of Richards, Schumann and Fantosi flashed up on the screen, followed by reams of medical data. Richards, Yvette, age 33, rank, captain, compound fracture left fibula, blood type O. Fantosi, Kirsty, age 25, rank, star demolition engineer, multiple fractures, both legs, blood type A. Schumann, Elaine, age 23, rank, flight coordinator, severe fractures, right ankle, blood type O. The cat's eyes darted across the significant details. Three, all injured and helpless? This is tremendous! Rimmer turned from the screen and smoothed down his hair. Tell them, he said, a new tone of authority in his voice. Tell them the boys from the Dwarf are on their way, or my name's not Captain A.J. Rimmer, space adventurer. Oh, thank you, Captain. Bless you. I'll tell them. Crichton shut down the transmission. Captain! Lister inclined his head forward and looked up at Rimmer through his eyebrows, as if peering over a pair of imaginary spectacles. Space adventurer! It's good psychology. What am I supposed to say? Fear not we're the blokes who used to clean the gunk out of the chicken soup machine. Actually, we know smeg all about space travel, but if you've got a blocked nozzle, we're your lads. That's going to have them oozing with confidence, isn't it? Hey, head, the cat said to Holly. How far away are we? Not far. 28 hours, he guessed. Only 28 hours? The cat leapt to his feet. I'd better start getting ready. I'm first in the shower room. Wow! He screamed with delight. I'm so excited. All six of my nipples are tingling. Look, said Lister. This is a mission of mercy. We're taking an injured crew, urgently needed medical supplies. We're not going down the disco on the pull. Dum, 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 dum. Disco music thundered out of Lister's eight-speakered portable wax blaster, which vibrated and slid across the metal surface of the sleeping quarters table. Dum, 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 dum. Lister mimicked the synth temp as he glided rhythmically over to his metal locker and pulled out his underwear drawer. One sock remained. He tutted and grooved across to his dirty laundry basket. Dum, dum, da, dum, dum. He pulled out two very hard, very stiff, rather dangerous-looking yellow socks. Holding them at arm's length, he sprayed them liberally with tiger deodorant, then put them on the table and hit them several times with a small toffee hammer. Dum, 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 da, dum, dum. He walked back to the locker, reverently took out an old brown paper bag and fished out his lucky scoring underpants. They had at one time been blue. Now they were a yellowy grey with holes in the cheeks and the elastic hung out of the waistband. He held them in his arms like he was holding the Turin shroud. These were the underpants he happened to be wearing the night he met Susan Warrington. Susan had got him drunk and taken advantage of his tender years on the ninth hole, par four, dogleg, of the Bootle Municipal Golf Course. 
He'd warned them again the night Alison Bredbury's dad had to be rushed off to hospital with a heart attack, leaving him alone with Alison, the key to the drinks cabinet, and her parents' double bed. From then, they'd achieved in his mind a mystic quality. He'd warned them sparingly, not wanting to use up their magic powers. Obviously, they'd not always been successful. In fact, a lot of the time they hadn't been successful. And slowly the dreadful thought had began to occur to him that they might just be a rather ordinary pair of dog-eared Y-fronts, and not some talismanic, spell-kissed, warlock-woven, sorcery-spun article of enchantment. They were just a pair of knickers. But then... Then he discovered if he wore them backwards, all their magical properties returned. Christine Kachansky. For four whole weeks, she was madly in love with him. For four whole weeks, he'd worn his backward boxes. Not daring to risk an ordinary pair, he'd washed them each night and worn them backwards throughout their relationship. Naturally, she'd asked him why. He told her he had 21 pairs of identical briefs and he always dressed in a hurry. She brought him new pairs and forced him to wear them. Like a fool, he did. And soon after, their relationship had ended. Dum, 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 dum. He slipped on the sacred shorts, backwards and inside out. No prisoners, he said aloud and glided over to the ironing board. He lifted the iron off his best green camouflage pants and pulled them on. He felt air on his buttock, and when he checked in the mirror, he found an iron-shaped hole clean through the right cheek. Dum, 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 dum. He rifled through his locker, found the colour he was looking for, and sprayed the exposed buttock with green car touch-up paint. He looked in the mirror again. From a distance, you honestly couldn't tell. True, he smelled like a newly painted Cortina, but that would fade in time. He slipped on his favourite London Jets t-shirt and stood back to take in the whole picture. The freshly hammered socks, the cleverly inverted underpants and the neatly sprayed trousers. Hey, he knew it wasn't perfection, but God it was close. Oh, you're not on the pull, eh? Rimmer stood in the doorway, wearing a dashing white officer's uniform, complete with banks of gleaming medals and gold hoops of rank which ran the length of his arm, which Holly had grudgingly simulated for him. Look at him, Rimmer thought. He's really trying. He's wearing all his least smeggy things. That t-shirt with only two curry stains on it. He only wears that on special occasions. Those camouflage pants with the fly buttons missing. You're toffed up to the nines, he said out loud. That's rich coming from someone who looks like Clive of India. Oh, it's started. Rimmer dusted some imaginary dust of his gold epaulette. I knew it would. What as? The put-downs. It's always the same. Every time we meet women, put me down to make yourself look good. Like when? Remember those two little brunettes from Supplies? And I said I'd once worked in the stores and they were very interested and asked me exactly what I used to do there. And I said you were a shelf. Right, exactly. So they laughed. Yes, at me. At my expense. Just don't do it, OK? Don't put me down when we meet them. Well, how do you want me to act then? How do you want me to behave? Just show a little respect. For a start, don't call me Rimmer. Why not? Because you always hit the rim at the beginning. rim er. You make it sound like a lavatory disinfectant. Well, what should I call you? I don't know. At something a bit more pally. Um, Arnie. Arn, maybe. Um, something a bit more... I don't know. How about Big Man? Big Man? How about Chief, then? The Duke? Cap, even? What about Old Iron Balls? Rimmer could see he wasn't really getting anywhere. Okay, then, he tried. 
How about the nickname I had at school? What? Bonehead? Impossible. Lister couldn't possibly have known his nickname at school was Bonehead. No one knew this. Not even his parents. What on Io makes you think my nickname at school was Bonehead? Well, it had to be, didn't it? What? It was a guess? Well, it it was a guess, as it turns out, that was completely way off the fairway and into the long grass. Uh, The nickname to which I was referring to was Ace. Your nickname was never Ace. Maybe Ace Hole. There you go again. Knock, knock, knock. Why can't you build me up instead of always putting me down? For instance? Well, I don't know. Uh, Perhaps if the chance occurs and it comes up naturally in the course of conversation, you could uh, possibly drop in a mention of the fact that I'm, well, very brave. Do what? Don't go crackers, just uh, perhaps uh, when my back's turned, you might steer the dialogue round to the fact that I died, and, well, I was pretty gosh darn brave about it. You're pretty gosh darn out of your smeggin' tree, Rimmer. Or you could bolster up my sexual past. Uh, Why don't you just casually hint that I've had tons of women? Uh, Would that break your heart, would it? Would that give you lung cancer to say that? Rimmer arched threateningly close to Lister's face, his eyes bulging. Just don't put me down, okay? All right, Rimmer ending there being both incredibly insecure and incredibly tough to deal with. It seems to me it's quite possible that this is the first time a woman might have ever been happy to see Arnold J. Rimmer. You can really feel the desperation of these three men trapped out in deep space. Even poor old Lister is succumbing to it, although I do appreciate his attempts to be as stylish as he can. (laughs) I guess that's the way you can describe it. And has anyone out there had a similar kind of experience of uh, being with a friend if you're trying to sort of be a wingman to them and um, perhaps trying to big them up? Or have you either not wanted to big them up or maybe you've done the opposite of Lister and gone a bit too far and uh, maybe made someone out to sound a lot better than they actually are? I think I might have done that with a friend of mine once. (laughs) I just uh, really oversold it. And uh, Gooch Souders in the comments said something that uh, relates a little bit to that last chapter where aliens uh, were involved and Rimmer's love for aliens and want to see some. Uh, It's an unfortunate thing that it is sort of um, confirmed within the world of Red Dwarf that part of their sort of unique take on the sci-fi is that they didn't find aliens when they went into space. And so even though there may be things that are non-human that appear within the story, they are often either uh, androids, mechanoids, or mutants and genetically engineered creatures created by human beings. But uh, in a discussion about time travel, which we'll get onto later, uh, Googe mentioned uh, that I believe in other life also. Millions of E-type planets in this galaxy, and then times it with millions of other galaxies in the universe. No idea what they look like or their intelligence. I believe a creator made many things and much life. Well, that's interesting. I also um, do ascribe to the idea that there is a lot of life out there in the universe. I don't necessarily have the same uh, cause for it. Maybe you're not a creator. I'm more of a just stuff happened. Uh, I find that interesting. Um, But I do certainly believe that the odds are there for there to be life out there in the universe. It could be even so far away that we'll never make contact within generations of our lifetimes. And we have no idea where that life is within its development cycle. It could be that there is life that could one day be intelligent like the human race is, but they are millions of years behind us. It's such a fascinating and interesting thought, and my favourite bit about it is that so far, within human experience, there is all of this space for us to theorise and ponder and So far, relatively few concrete answers. Um, There is still room to learn new things and to discover new things, and I think we will always be eternally surprised by the nature of the universe. And I think that is a spectacular thing about science and life in general. But sorry, that's enough of me waxing poetic. Thank you very much, Googe, for having these interesting conversations with me. Now on to chapter 17. Come on, everyone. They're here. They're in orbit. Heavens, there's so much to do. 
Crichton rushed down the sloping corridor, pausing only to water a lusciously green plastic pot plant. Things were going very well. Very well indeed. The girls had been quiet and really most forlorn of late. Being marooned light years from home with scant hope of rescue had been very trying, to say the least. He'd done his best to keep them entertained, to keep their spirits high, but over the last few weeks he'd felt intuitively that they were losing hope. Even his Friday night concert parties, usually the highlight of the week, had begun to be greeted with growing apathy. Miss Yvette was especially guilty of this. She hadn't particularly enjoyed them from the beginning and had told him so. The concert parties always began in the same way. After baths and supper, Crichton would clear the decks while the girls played cards or read. At nine, the sharp lights would be dimmed and Crichton would tap dance onto a makeshift stage in the engine room, singing, I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy, juggling two cans of beeswax. Then he'd go into his impressions. His best one was of Parker, the mechanoid aboard the Neutron Star. But none of the girls knew him, so it never went down that well. Then there were the magic tricks, or to put it more accurately, the magic trick. He would lie in a box and saw himself in half. It wasn't much of a trick because he actually did saw himself in half. And then the evening suffered a slight hiatus while they waited the 40 minutes it took for Crichton to reconnect his circuitry. Then he'd round off the evening with a selection of hits from the student prince. Then they'd play prize bingo. The prize in the prize bingo was always a can of Jiffy Window Clean. Nobody ever wanted a can of Jiffy Window Clean, so Crichton always got it back and was able to use it as the next week's prize. In an odd kind of way, Crichton was grateful for the accident. His life had taken on a new vitality. He was needed. The girls depended on him. His days were full. There was cooking, the changing of bandages, the physiotherapy, the concert parties, and of course, there was the cleaning. Crichton took almost orgasmic delight in housework. Piles of dirty dishes thrilled him. Mounds of unwashed laundry filled him with rapture. An unmopped floor left him dry-mouthed with lust. He loved cleaning things even more than he loved things being clean, and things being clean sent him into a frenzy of ecstasy. And at night, when everyone was safely tucked in bed and all the chores were done, and there was absolutely nothing left to clean, then, and only then, he'd sink into his favourite chair, cushions plump, and watch Androids. Androids was a soap opera, aimed at the large mechanoid audience who had huge buying power when it came to household goods. Crichton had all 1,974 episodes on disc. He'd seen them all many times, but he still winced when Karstaris was killed in the plane crash. He still wept when Rose left Benzen. He still laughed and slapped his metal knee when Hudson won the mechanoid lottery and hired his human master as a servant. And he always cheered when Molly took on the android brothels, put the pimps into prison and set the prostidroids free. Androids, he told himself, was his one vice. That and the single chocolate he allowed himself each viewing to conserve supplies. When he watched Androids, he wasn't just a mechanoid, marooned light years from nowhere, with three demanding dependents and a never-ending schedule of work. He was somewhere different, somewhere glamorous, somewhere else. He was Hudson, winning the lottery and hiring a human to serve him. He was JC, winning the mega quid buck deals, dining in the best restaurants, living in his vast penthouse atop the Juno Hilton. He was someone else. Crichton rushed down the slope and onto the main service deck where the girls were breakfasting. Come on, they're here! He clapped his hands. Richards, Schumann and Fantosi didn't move. They hadn't moved, in fact for almost three million years. The three skeletons sat round the table in freshly laundered uniforms 
and grinned. I don't know what's so funny, said Crichton. They'll be here any moment, and there's so much to do. He clucked and shook his head. Miss Elaine, honestly, you haven't even made an effort. Look at your hair. He fussed over the table and took out a hairbrush. What a mess you look. He hummed, stay young and beautiful, and combed her long, blonde wig with smooth, gentle strokes. When her hair was just so, he stood back and eyed her critically. He wasn't quite satisfied. He took out a lipstick that matched her uniform and touched up her makeup. Dazzling! You could go straight on the cover of Vogue! He shuffled down the table. Miss Yvette, you haven't touched your soup. It's no wonder you're looking so pasty. He patted her gingerly on the shoulder. There was a long, slow, creaking noise, and the skeleton slumped face down into the bowl of tomato soup. Crichton threw his hands up in horror. Eat nicely, Miss Yvette. What will that nice Captain Rimmer think if he sees you eating like that? He hoisted the skeleton back onto the chair, sprayed her with a squirt of window clean, and gave her head a quick polish. Now then, Miss Kirsty. He waddled over to the remaining skeleton and looked her up and down. The trendy knee-length boots, the chic, deep red miniskirt, and the peaked velvet cap cocked at a racy angle. No, he beamed, putting the hairbrush away. You look absolutely perfect. And so we have our reveal there that unfortunately this crash did not happen recently. This happened when the human race was still alive and potentially while the Red Dwarf crew was still alive. But oh dear, three million years later and Crichton appears to have some sort of computer senility similar to what Holly has but perhaps worse since he's so delusioned. But oh dear, Crichton I think was already a little bit skew-whiff considering his cleaning habits made the ship crash in the first place. Since that was a short chapter, let's jump straight into chapter 18. The cat slinked down the docking bay gantry in his gold, hand-stitched flight suit, carrying a two-feet-high, cone-shaped matching space helmet under his arm. He climbed up the boarding steps into the blue midget, where Lister and Rimmer were sitting in the drive seats, waiting for him. He jumped into the cramped cabin, struck a pose like the king of rocket men, legs splayed, chest puffed out, hand on one hip, and said, Put your shades on, guys! You're looking at a nuclear explosion in Lurex! He gleamed, a smile at them, and fluttered his eyes. You looking good? said Lister, craning round. Looking good? Did I hear the man say looking only good? Buddy, I am a plastic surgeon's nightmare. Throw away the scalpel. Improvements are impossible. A spacesuit, said Rimmer, with cufflinks. Listen, said the cat, dusting the console seat before arranging himself on it. You've got to guarantee me we don't pass any mirrors. As if I do, I'm there for the day. Lister flicked on the remote link with Holly. Holly appeared on the screen, looking somehow different. Lister scrutinised the image. He couldn't quite work out what it was. All right then, dudes. Everybody set? Lister twigged. Holly, why are you wearing a toupee? Holly was upset. He'd spent some considerable time corrupting his digital image to give himself a fuller head of hair. So it's not undetectable then? It doesn't blend in naturally and seamlessly with my own natural hair. It looks, said Lister, like you've got a small furry animal nesting on top of your head. What is wrong with everybody? Rimmer straightened his cap. Three million years without a woman and you all go crazy. Well, he's right, thought Holly. Who am I trying to impress? I'm a computer. How humiliating to have that pointed out by a hologram. Blue Midget, the powerful haulage transporter originally designed to carry ore and silicates to and from the ship, looked strangely graceful 
as it flickered between the red and blue lights of the twin sun system above the howling, icy green wasteland of the moon that had become Nova Five's graveyard. Lister peered through the furry dice dangling from the windscreen. Nice place for a skiing holiday. Rimmer stared unblinkingly at the tracking monitor. Nothing yet, he said helpfully. He slipped his finger down the collar of his shirt, where a large boil was really beginning to hurt. Lister struggled hopelessly with the twelve gear levers. Each provided five gears, making it sixty gears in all, and Lister hadn't yet been in the right one throughout the twenty-minute jag. The tracking monitor started delivering a series of rapid bleeps. We've got it, Rimmer cried. Lat, twenty-seven, four. Long, seventeen, seven. Lister looked at him like he was speaking Portuguese. Left a bit and round that glacier. Oh, right. Lister landed appallingly in 47th gear. Blue Midget stalled, bounced and rocked before settling to rest with an exhausted sigh. Lister pushed in the button marked C. The caterpillar tracks telescoped out of their housing rotated down to the icy emerald surface and hoisted the transporter ten feet above the ground. Hey, said the cat, impressed. You really can't drive this thing. Actually, said Lister, I thought that was the cigarette lighter. The red-hot wiper blades melted green slush from the windscreen as blue midget rose and fell over a series of icy dunes. As they reached the peak of the next range, they saw in the hollow below the broken wreck, jutting out of the landscape like a child's discarded toy. The gearbox groaned and rattled as they made their slippery descent down into the crater. Yoo-hoo! The cat squealed in falsetto and waved madly out of the port side window. Ah, oh, come on in, come on in! Crichton ushered them in from the airlock. How lovely to meet you, he said, and bowed deeply. Sharmita, said Rimmer, speaking too loudly. What a delightful craft. Reminds me of my first command. He turned and hissed to Lister. Call me Ace. Lister pretended not to understand and walked off down the spotless, newly painted white corridor after Crichton who was chatting banalities about the weather. Green slush again. Tut, tut, tut. The cat flossed his teeth one last time and followed them. Crichton, used to the strange tilt, walked speedily down the thin corridor, listing at an odd angle. He went through a large, pear-shaped hatchway, and they followed him across what must have been the ship's engine room. Even Lister, who knew next to nothing about these things, could tell Nova Five's technology was far in advance of Red Dwarfs. Taking up three quarters of the room was the strangest piece of machinery Lister had ever seen. It was like a huge series of merry-go-rounds stacked one on top of the other and turned on their sides. Each of these was filled with silver discs joined by thick gold rods, and at the end, was what looked like an enormous cannon. What's that? asked Lister. It's the ship's drive, Crichton replied. It's the duality jump. What's a duality jump? But don't be thick, Lister. Everybody knows what a duality jump is, said Rimmer, lying. Crichton scurried through the pear-shaped exit, and Lister practically had to sprint out of the engine room to catch up with them two corridors later. Suddenly, the cat swivelled as they passed a full-length mirror recessed in the wall. His heart pounded, his pulse quickened, he felt silly and giddy. He was in love. You're a work of art, baby! He crooned softly at his reflection. Lister turned and shouted, Come on! I can't! You're gonna have to help me! Lister picked up his golden-booted foot and started to yank him down the corridor. Unable to help himself, the cat hung on to the mirror. His gloved fingers squeaked across the glass surface as Lister pulled him free. Thanks, man, the cat said gratefully. That was a bad one.
I'm so excited, said Crichton, shuffling along and absently dusting a completely clean fire extinguisher. We all are. The girls can hardly stop themselves from jumping up and down. Ha ha ha! brayed Rimmer falsely. Sharmita, Sharmita. Ah, said Crichton. Vipurlasas esperanton, Capitano Rimmer. Uh, I'm sorry? Vi parolas esperanton, Capitano Rimmer. Uh, come again? You speak esperanto, Captain Rimmer? Ah, oui, oui, uh, yavol, uh, si, si. Rimmer searched desperately through his memory for the appropriate phrase. Mercifully, it came to him. A bon volu al sendi la pordiston lausagne estas rano e mia bedeo. A, a frog? said Crichton. In which bidet? Ha ha ha! brayed Rimmer, even less convincingly. It doesn't matter, I'll deal with it myself. Crichton walked round the corner and down the ramp onto the service deck. Well, here they are, he said. Without looking where Crichton was beckoning, Rimmer bent down on one knee and swept his cap in a smooth arc. Charmita, he purred. Lister and the cat tumbled in behind him. Their eyes met the hollow sockets of three grinning skeletons sitting around the table. There was a very, very long silence. It was followed by another very, very long silence. Well, said Crichton, a little upset, isn't anybody going to say hello? Hi, said Lister weakly. I'm Dave, this is the cat, and this here is Ace. Rimmer still hadn't closed his mouth from forming the final vowel of Charmita. Lister leaned over and whispered to him conspiratorially, I think that little blonde one's giving you the eye cap. Now, Crichton clapped his hands, you all get to know one another and I'll run off and fetch some tea. He staggered off up the slope. I don't believe this, said Rimmer, massaging the H on his forehead. Lister looked at him. Be strong, big man. Our one contact with intelligent life in over three million years, and he turns out to be an android version of Norman Bates. So they're a little on the skinny side, said the cat, ever hopeful. A few hot dinners and who knows? Lister walked up to the table and put his arms around two of the skeleton's shoulders. I know this may not be the time or place to say this, girls, but, uh, my mate Ace here is incredibly, incredibly brave. Smeg off, dog food face. And he's got tons and tons of girlfriends. I'm warning you, Lister. Crichton raced back down the slope, carrying a tray which held several plates of triangular-shaped sandwiches, a pot of steaming tea, and a plate with several of his precious chocolates on it. As he laid out the cups on the table, he looked up, suddenly aware of the lack of conversation. Is something wrong? he asked. Something wrong? said Rimmer, aghast. They're dead! Who's dead? asked Crichton, pouring some milk into the cups. They're dead! Rimmer waved at the three skeletons. They're all dead! My God! Crichton stepped back in horror. I was only away two minutes! They've been dead for centuries! No! Yes! Are you a doctor? You only had to look at them! Rimmer whined. They've got less meat on them than a chicken nugget! Well, what am I going to do? Crichton stammered. I'm programmed to serve them! Well, the first thing we should do is, you know, bury them, said Lister quietly. You're that sure they're dead? Yes! Rimmer shouted. Crichton waddled over to Richard's leering skeleton. What about this one? Rimmer sighed. Look, there's a very simple test. He walked up to the head of the table. All right, he said. 
Hands up, any of you who are alive. Crichton looked on anxiously. To his dismay, there was no response. He made frantic signals, coaxing the girls to raise their hands. OK, said Rimmer finally. Crichton's shoulders buckled, and he dropped limply onto a chair, totally defeated. I thought they might be, but I wouldn't allow myself. I didn't want to admit I, I... I'm programmed to serve them. It's all I can do. I let them down so badly. I... Lister shuffled uncomfortably. What am I to do? Crichton said plaintively. A buzzer went off in Crichton's head. It was his internal alarm clock telling him that it was time for Miss Yvette's bath. Automatically, he raised himself and then remembering, sank back down again. He took a sonic screwdriver from his top pocket, flipped a series of release catches on his neck, removed his head, and plonked it down unceremoniously on the table. What are you doing? said the cat. I'm programmed to serve, said Crichton's head. They're dead. The program is finished. I'm activating my shutdown disc. Whoa, said Lister, slow down. Crichton's hands twisted the right ear off his disembodied head and pressed a latch which flipped open his skull. Crichton, listen to me. Crichton started removing the minute circuit boards from inside his brain and stacking them neatly on the table. Crichton! He took out several branches of interface leads, neatly wrapped them up and placed them tidily beside the rest of his mind. Finally, he located his shutdown program. Sorry about the mess, he said, and switched himself off. His eyes rotated back into the plastic of his skull. His body slumped forward in his seat and crashed onto the floor. And so, Crichton doesn't have anyone else to serve, so will he perhaps agree to come aboard Red Dwarf? Well, only if they get him working again. So what's going to happen there? We'll have to read on to find out, but before I do, let's say hello to the other folks in the comments. Some real nice people in here. We have Omar, who says, To be fair, this version of time manipulation is better than spinning the earth backwards. And also mentions that uh, the same American version of Scrap Heap Challenge uh, is called... Uh, oh, sorry, yeah. So the same American the Scrap Yard Challenge is Junkyard Wars. That's what it's called. And the machines were always ludicrous but fun to watch. And yes, I agree. I always love those kind of shows. I definitely saw uh, a Discovery Kids like adaptation where like they got kids to do similar stuff. But all of those things, I love the creativity that they use to get around engineering problems. And continuing on from time, thinking about the future echoes that were being experienced earlier in the book, uh, Gooch has said, I've read tons of thinking on time travel. I think it's possible, but I think we'll never do it, but it is possible. I think it's possible, but humans will probably fight rather than share the tech to get us to that point. An interesting idea. Uh, a little darker, a bit more like what we sort of see here in uh, Red Dwarf, a darker version of the future. I would like to go to the 1800s, says Googe. Any part of the world, English-speaking, Australia, British Isles, America, perhaps even the early 1800s or 1700s. I know many old skills from those days and could possibly fit in. Interesting. So you're thinking of going to a place where you would be best able to survive and blend in and perhaps observe the people around you. A very interesting idea. I like it. I don't share your skills and ability to perhaps blend in or survive easier in a different time period. However, I would quite love to see, I think, England and Britain in general um, in the sort of 1500s, the Tudor sort of period. Um, partly because I love the country that I live in, but I feel like we are, we, we're, we're not wild anymore. We've had a lot of the wilderness, a lot of the nature stripped back in this country. There's an awful lot of animals in this country that are just hunted out of existence. They're just not here. Bears and wolves and beavers and otters are things that are so scarce and can't be seen out in the English countryside. I would love to see what England used to be like when the forests were stretching for hundreds if not thousands of miles and were full of wild things. That, I think, would be quite beautiful. All right, I'm going to stop yammering and get on to chapter 19. But if you want to tell me where you'd like to go back into the past or perhaps into the future, if you could time travel, let me know. It's a cool subject I'm always down to discuss. Now here's the chapter. 
It's driving me batty. Must you do it here? Rimmer surveyed the array of android organs spread higgledy-piggledy all over the sleeping quarters. What's this on my pillow? It's his eyes! I'm trying to fix him, said Lister, holding Crichton's nose in one hand and poking a pipe cleaner soaked in white spirit up his nostril with the other. It had taken them a week to transform the two broken halves of the Nova Five back to Red Dwarf. They had needed all six of the remaining transporter craft, operating on autopilot, to wrench the ship free of the centuries-old methane ice. But after five days of maximum thrust, the small transporters had finally yanked the wreck clear, and hauled it slowly and precariously up to the orbiting Red Dwarf. The drive section of Nova 5 held few supplies. Crichton had meticulously updated the inventory every Tuesday evening for two million years. Most of the food was still vacuum stored. Lister had been delighted to discover they had 25,000 spicy poppadoms and 130 tons of mango chutney. Enough, he pointed out at the time, to keep him happy for the best part of a month. There was, thankfully, nearly 2,000 gallons of irradiated cow's milk, and Lister had insisted the dog's milk be flushed out into the vacuum of space, where it had instantly frozen, leaving a huge dog milk asteroid for some future species to ponder over. Why do you have to keep his bits all over my bunk? So I know where they are. Yes, well, I'm sorry, but I refuse to have somebody else's eyes on my pillow. Look, I'll have them finished by this afternoon. You've been saying that for two months. What's this in my coffee mug? It's a big toe. Rimmer, will you just smeg off and leave me to it? What the smeg do you want to repair him for anyway? He's just a mechanoid. A mechanoid that's gone completely barking mad. I want to find out about that duality drive. I want to know if we can fix it. And, but I don't know. I feel sorry for him. Sorry for him? He's a machine. It's like feeling sorry for a tractor. It's not. He's got a personality. Yes, a personality that should be severely sedated, bound in a metal straitjacket and locked in a rubber room with a stick between his teeth. I think I can fix that. You think it's just like repairing your bike, don't you? Spot of grease, clean all his bits, rebore his carburetor and bang, he's as good as new. Same principle. He's got a defect in his artificial intelligence. You need a degree in advanced mental engineering from Caltech to set him to rights. Lister prodded one of Crichton's circuit boards with a soldering iron. The noseless head fizzed momentarily into life. Aha! it said in rapid falsetto. Elephant rain dingle bat Vietnam. The eyes on Rimmer's pillow rotated and blinked. Telephone, sandwich, kerplunk, armadillo, rumple, stiltskin, purple. Well, Rimmer said, once again you've proved me wrong. <coughs> Rimmer looked at his bunkside clock. 2.43 a.m. <coughs> Rimmer clambered down from his bunk and looked over Lister's sleeping body. He was still holding one of Crichton's circuit boards in one hand and a sonic screwdriver in the other. And I'm supposed to keep you sane, he thought. Who the smeg is supposed to keep me sane? Rimmer closed his eyes and tried to sleep. It was useless. He got Holly to simulate his red, black, white, blue, yellow and orange striped skiing anorak and decided to check out the salvage operation in the shuttle bay. Rimmer voice activated the huge corrugated lead doors of Bay 17, which yawned open to reveal the two halves of the wreck of the Nova 5. Even though it was early hours of the morning, the massive salvage operation was in full flow. Rimmer looked down from the gantry at the battalions of scutters who were still unloading supplies from the mainly undamaged front section. 
Another group of scutters, wielding laser torches, were still trying to cut their way through the hull of the rear section. Even with the most powerful bazookoid lasers, their progress had been slow, barely two centimetres a day through the metre-thick strontium algol alloy. But what really interested Rimmer was the second half of the Nova 5. He'd gone through some of the ship's computer files and had a very good reason to suspect that the dead segment contained something that might very well change his life. He stood on the gantry, hands in his ski anorak pockets, watching the scutters lasering their way through the hull. How long before we're in? he asked Holly. Two, maybe three days. There was a noise, the sound of creaking metal buckling and rippling as huge, arc-shaped doors, which the laser torches were cutting into the craft's side, slowly teetered forward and fell like a medieval drawbridge, crushing all eight scutters. Maybe even sooner, added Holly unconvincingly. Rimmer raced down the gantry steps and across the steel floor of the hangar to the newly burned entrance in the stern section of the hulk of Nova 5. He peered into the dusty gloom. Floor lights glowed dimly down the length of the corridor. He summoned two scutters away from their unloading duties and, sending them ahead, stepped inside. The corridor was still warm from the laser torches. Electric cables and dismembered circuitry hung down from the ceiling, like dead tubers in a petrified forest. Rimmer inched his way along the corridor as the scutter's headlights cut sways through the murky gloom. Most of the doors were open or hanging off their hinges. There was a sensation, a feeling he couldn't explain, that the ship wasn't dead. There was something there, something alive. Slowly, he worked his way around the tortured topography of the first deck, then clambered down the broken spiral staircase and found himself on the stasis corridor. Most of the booths had been scooped clean by the scalpel-sharp corner of the glacier in the crash. Three remained. Two of them were punctured. And inside, the once human occupants had been fossilised into the walls by centuries upon centuries of patient ice. The third was occupied. Skeletal legs jutted through a gash in the stasis booth door. The impact of the crash had driven the incumbent's limbs through the reinforced glass. Rimmer peered in through what remained of the observation window. Somehow, the rest of the body had been preserved, wedged half in and half out of the stasis booth. The legs had withered with age, while the upper body remained in suspended animation, timeless, unaging, unharmed. Rimmer voice activated the door. Surely he couldn't be alive. The door lock twirled and the door arced open. The man opened his eyes and looked down at his legs. His scream cut through Rimmer like a shard of jagged glass. Then he stopped screaming and died of shock. Rimmer's heart went on a cross-country run around his body. It bounced off his stomach, caromed into his ribcage, and tried to make a forced exit through his windpipe. It was still hammering around his chest cavity like a deranged pinball when he finally stopped running four decks up. He fell into a twilit recreation room and was on his haunches, still trying to suck air into his reluctant lungs, when he turned and saw the figure standing by the fruit machine. His brain uttered a silent expletive, and his heart put on its spiked shoes and went for another lap. My goodness, what is happening here? So we had the possibility of another survivor, although that went away quite quickly. I feel like if you dealt with that better, Rimmer, he might not have died. Maybe ask the supercomputer first before you go, you know, let's just open him and see how he manages having his arms being three million years older than the rest of himself. But intrigue builds with who is this figure? Who else could be there? Everyone's accounted for, aren't they? 
Well, let's find out. Before I do, let's say hi to Zero, who kindly commented, said doing this while working and genuinely had to stop to have a re-listen at 57.14. Uh, that was when I was uh, trying to sing the new musical scale that Holly invented. Uh, Zero is very kind and says, your narration is on point. Thank you so much. I'm glad you enjoy it. Now I'll move on to chapter 20. This is going to be our last chapter for this episode. The figure turned to face him. The hologrammatic H on her forehead glinted fluorescently in the blue light of the games room. Ah, there you are, she smiled. Where's Yvette? I've been waiting for ages. Yvette who? I needed those course calculations. She walked six paces towards him and held out her hand. Thank you, she said, and disappeared. Suddenly, she reappeared at the fruit machine with her back to him. Are you okay? said Rimmer, getting to his feet. She turned. Ah, there you are, she smiled. Where's Yvette? I've been waiting for ages. I need those course calculations. Yet again, she stepped towards him, held out her hand, and vanished, reappearing once more at the other side of the room. Ah, there you are. She smiled again, and Rimmer left. Quart dingbat fuzzagog Netherlands, said Crichton's disembodied head. Smirk window clean double helix badger. There was a fzzt of a circuit shorting, and his eyes blinked closed. A thin wisp of smoke curled up from his open skull. Lister cursed. He peeked into Crichton's mechanoid brain, tutted, and fished out a half-eaten three-day-old cheese sandwich with chilli dressing. He prodded around with his soldering iron, absently biting into the sandwich. The cat walked in with his lunch on a tray and sat down at the table. If you try to take this food, you're in serious personal danger. I am not going to try and take it. Just don't even think about it. The cat pulled an embroidered lace lobster bib out of his top pocket and tied it around his neck. From his inside pocket, he produced a solid silver case, lined with velvet and containing an exquisite set of gold cutlery with hand-carved mother-of-pearl handles, which he placed either side of his plate. He rubbed his hands together and went into his food-taunting eating ritual. I'm gonna eat a little chicky, he chanted at the chicken merengo. I'm gonna eat a little chicky, I'm gonna eat a little chicky, cause I like eating chicks. The song finished, and he looked away from the food, like a baseball pitcher checking the bases. Then, suddenly, flicked the chicken off the plate, and in the same smooth movement, caught it mid-air with the same hand, and put it back on the plate. Too slow, Chicken Moringo, he chided. Too slow for this cat. Why don't you just eat it? It's no fun if you don't give it a chance. But it's dead. It's cooked. Whoa! The cat slapped his hand down on the plate, sending the chicken spinning into the air and over his shoulder. He kicked away from the chair, somersaulted backwards, and caught it in his mouth before it hit the ground. Hey, this chicken is faster than I thought. He put the chicken back on the plate and had just started to juggle the potatoes when Rimmer walked in. Gentlemen, he beamed broadly, there's someone I'd like you to meet. Someone who's a deep personal friend of mine. Someone who, I'm sure, will enrich all our lives. Someone I've decided who will be a more interesting and stimulating bunkmate for myself. Which is why I intend to move in with this someone to the spare sleeping quarters next door. Gentlemen, Rimmer gestured like a medieval courtesan, and into the open doorframe stepped someone Lister and the cat recognised instantly. There, in the hatchway, standing beside Arnold J. Rimmer, was another completely identical Arnold J. Rimmer. So can that honestly be a good idea, having two of the Smegheads on the ship? I don't think so, and I'm not sure that Rimmer will be able to put up with himself. Could you manage that? I don't, yeah, I'm not sure I'd like having another version of me around, mostly because we'd both want to play Elden Ring at the same time. 
Thanks very much as always, my friends, for listening. If you have enjoyed this video, please do me a favour and give it a like. Uh, if you haven't subscribed already, please do. Not only do we have Red Dwarf, but we do have a lot of fantastic audiobooks here on the channel for you to enjoy. And my friends, please make sure to check out our live streams. We are here going live every Saturday at 4.30pm uh, uh, Mountain Time. No, not Mountain Time. Eastern Time. 4.30pm Eastern. 2.30pm Mountain. 1.30pm uh, Pacific. And if if you're in the UK, it is 9.30pm. That's every Saturday. Come and hang out with us. And on Sundays, we have a new live stream show where you can come and play a choose-your-own-adventure book with me and my brother. You get to choose where we go in the story. That is at 5 p.m. if you're here in the UK, but if you're over in the States, it is at 12 p.m. Eastern. It is at 10 a.m. Mountain, and it is at 9 a.m. Pacific. If you're somewhere in between, I am sorry. I hope that's enough for you to figure it out. All right, my friends, thank you so much. Remember, we are all Fulcrum, and I'll see you next time.